Oh, welcome to another amazing episode of It's the Bottom Line That Matters podcast. On today's program, we have a really cool, super uh, gift for you guys. We have a crisis communications expert. Lorraine Shukart is with us today, and we're really excited to have her. Now, here's where it really comes uh, important. We all know, as uh, we spoke about on prior episodes, there's so much that we have uh, in terms of looking at what is that we're dealing with in unforeseen circumstances, right? We all know those unforeseen circumstances that come up and throw monkey wrenches out there and really start getting us crazy. We also know we live in an extremely litigious society. We know that there are always going to be people who are going to be throwing all sorts of lies, and substantiated allegations at company leaders, at politicians, at people on the street, people in the park, doesn't matter where you are. And so it becomes an extremely important part of any business, especially to have a plan in place about how to deal with when a crisis actually arises. And so we asked our friend Lorraine to come on the program today. And Lorraine is going to help us get a little bit more information on what exactly it is, a crisis communications plan, where we need to go, what we need to do, and go from there. But before I have Lorraine actually introduce herself, I just want to give you a little bit of background about Lorraine so that you know why she is such an amazing guest on our program today. So Lorraine Shukart is the founder of Prosper for Purpose, which is an impact relations agency that helps purpose-driven leaders achieve social and environmental impact. Lorraine previously was a consultant and writer for companies including Jeep, Nabisco, Lazy Boy, and Joanne Store. Joanne Stores, but her desire to use business as a force for good inspired her to launch Prosper for Purpose, which is a business as a force for good, in January of 2013. She's worked on national and international businesses and nonprofits that align with the company's values. She practices a servant leadership form of management with her team. And in 2020, Lorraine launched the Peerless Brand Builders to help entrepreneurs take their businesses online. Her free workshops led to the launch of the Peerless Entrepreneur, which is a 12-month program focused on building brands of influence online. Now, Lorraine, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here, Jennifer. I'm really excited to talk with you. Thank you. So, Lorraine, let me ask you, uh, before I bring in uh, Daniel and Patricia, tell us more in terms of crisis communications, I alluded to what it is, but can you give us more background, more of an idea in terms of what is it? Like people have heard about public relations, they've heard of potentially investor relations, but crisis communications may be a new one. Yeah, so crisis communications really is a plan for your company should the things that you hope will never happen occur. And it covers how to manage the communications from the inside out. So whereas investor relations is concerned with communicating, obviously, with your stakeholders, a crisis communicate or with your shareholders, rather, a, a comprehensive crisis communications plan is focused on communicating with all stakeholders. So first and foremost, hopefully your employees so that your team is taken care of. They know what's happening, what their role of, uh, in everything that's transpiring is, and you can move forward with the minimum amount of damage, um, if at all, depending on what's going on. So a crisis communications plan can cover anything um, from a minor thing like closing because of a tornado or something um, putting down power lines and knowing how to engage 
to the huge things that we know and all remember, like the Tylenol crisis and the Exxon oil spill. So it really runs the gamut. So this sounds to me then that if somebody is looking at their business continuity plan, that a crisis communications plan really should be part of that. Am I correct in that? Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, it could be a sub plan of that. And then it's something that should be easily accessible to all members of the team. And, and, you know, we're thinking in terms of big companies, like, you know, your IT team flipping the message that should be replaced the homepage of your website. But we're also talking about even solopreneurs, like what are they doing if there's a crisis to communicate with their clients and their, and their other stakeholders, whoever those may be. So the idea is that the plan is such that it can work regardless of the crisis, but it's tailored to you based on the um, unique perspectives and the size of your organization. Got it. So as we're looking at the crisis communications, does it come, well, you mentioned that it has to come from the top in terms of, you know, sharing that information with the people in the business. And I know Daniel, as our leadership expert, has definitely spoken many, many times in terms of messaging coming from the top down, you know, whether it's a mission of the business, it's a where do we go? It's the more morale of the business, things along those lines. There's a lot that comes from there. But let me ask you, if we're looking at preparing the plan and making sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's, how are we knowing that we're getting the right information in there as opposed to leaving things out? And I'm going to kind of piggyback on that question before I let you answer that. Um, we have our business plans that a lot of us hopefully have in our businesses, but the problem is too many of us have a business plan and it's stuck in our desk because we only needed it when we may have gone to the um, SBA for funding. We haven't looked at it in 15 years or whatever it is. And I know that we've said it's got to be a living, breathing document. Right, we've spoken about that on our podcast before, but is a crisis communications plan something that, like many businesses, business owners do, throw it in the desk and pull it out only in the in the event of we've got that national crisis going on, or is it something that is needing to be that living, breathing document as well? So. It depends on the company entirely. I haven't seen any stats on that. We do know that among large businesses, more than 80% do have a comprehensive crisis communications plan, but in businesses overall, it's right around 50%. And then we also know that more than 50% of small businesses close after a crisis. So, you know, this is very timely. We're hopefully coming out of a pandemic. We saw last year um, the struggle that businesses went through, and certainly we hope that this was an anomaly. It was a prolonged crisis that, that led to detrimental financial impact for many businesses, um, and a crisis communications plan may not have helped save the, the, the businesses that we lost last year. But the idea is that it prepares you to the best of your ability to be responsive to these unexpected events. And hopefully it will shorten the, the, the impact, the time of the impact and protect your employees and also protect your reputation because while some crises are due to natural disasters or things that we can't control, some things that happen within organizations are from are things that, that should have been done better, right? So the, the oversight was lacking and it led to a crisis. And then how do you deal with that? So um, I think that to answer your question, every company should have a plan and they should review it at least annually 
And uh, while I agree with Daniel that most things come top down, it's really important that you have a seasoned communications expert drafting the, the, um, the crisis communications plan with input from all the departments so that you don't have to wait. Like, what if the CEO is part of the crisis? I mean, you know, we don't want to think about those things. What if a plane goes down and the executive leadership was on that plane? Everybody else, the heads of those departments or the next person in command should be able to hit go and get that plan up and running within a, a number of hours, not, not days. Right. I mean, you mentioned the CEO and... There was recently an incident where one of the telehealth um, medicine companies, the CEO, was ousted out of his uh, position with the company entirely because of a couple of, um, to quote my governor, um, Governor Murphy, a couple of uh, goofball uh, kind of comments. And uh, honestly, they were a little bit worse than that, but we'll mm. kind of go with goofball. Um, and we know that very often, I mean, celebrities and everybody definitely is involved in that. But let me ask you this, though. Um, for a lot of us, especially here in the States, we at least heard of this show Scandal if we didn't watch the show. And Olivia was one of these spin doctors mm -hmm. who was one of these crisis managers, right? I mean, the show started where Liv was going and she was helping all these politicians who were having scandal after scandal after scandal, hence the name Scandal. Um, and eventually it took a much deeper turn and um, went in a completely different direction. <laughs> but how is somebody, though, that's looking at this? Because we know public relations, right? We know that a publicist for any celebrity is trying to get them booked on shows, trying to get them out on the speaker circuit, things along those lines. Sometimes these same publicists need to be in the forefront when they do something stupid or when there's a massive breakup. I mean, we've heard of uh, Kim and Kanye, right? We've and all, I think we've honestly, all heard of Kim and Kanye at this point. <laughs> right, honestly, I am so sick of hearing about them. But we know that the crisis mode, when they were going through their breakup and everything, kicked into high gear, right? Because you had all the magazines starting to break it before even they were talking about it. You have um, Meghan and Prince Harry, who the papers are absolutely loving with the all sorts of different scandals and everything else that they want to throw in. I don't know if the rest of the world loves it as much as the British and the Americans, because um, it seems like we have the lock on scandal. Uh, you don't hear as much like, oh, yeah, the media is all over, you know, Vladimir Putin. I, I don't know. I mean, I think you'll get you'll get hanged or thrown in a deep hole somewhere. But if we were looking at it from the perspective of, though, what is it that really separates those, quote unquote, spin doctors from a good crisis person that is going to be in that position? Or is that crisis person still spinning the story in order to get ahead of it or avoid more dominoes falling in reactionary mode? Yes. So look, um, it would be super easy for me to say, yeah, publicists are, are bad and probably doing it wrong and real PR people are great and doing it right. But the truth lies somewhere in between. There's some really good um, celebrity publicists out there. I'm not going to name names. Um, there's some really bad ones too. And then we can also laugh at the whole Kim Kanye thing, but realize that there's um, millions of dollars at stake. You know, there's there's joint ventures. And so there was a, a financial concern, I think, as well as the celebrity concern. Now, yes, 
you know, people that have no vested interest in the financial um, status are, are still drawn to it, kind of like an accident or that voyeuristic tendency to know what goes on with celebrities. But I do think there is one point of differentiation. A true public relations specialist, counselor, strategist, however you want to clarify them, you know, really abides by a code of ethics. And that code of ethics is that you are you always act with integrity, that you always tell the truth. It may not be the whole truth. There may be things that are confidential um, or you may be withholding for a limited period of time. But the, 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 I guess the simple strategy of crisis communications is tell the truth and tell it first so that you can control the story. And PR people hate the term spin doctor and they hate being, you know, automatically assumed that they're publicists because that's publicity, just like investor relations, that's one area of specialization. But most PR people are more generalists than they are, you know, one specific area of PR because you think of PR as, as the relationships with all of your stakeholders from the inside out. And again, you know, I started this by saying your crisis communications plan starts with your employees. They're the ones that are going to flip all the switches to make sure that the plan's in motion. Lorraine, I've got a, a question that you mentioned in a, a previous answer to one of Jennifer's questions um, about putting your plan together. So I'm thinking of the, uh, the small business owner now, maybe uh, they are the CEO, the owner, the operator, you know, they're doing everything. Maybe they've got a few employees. Um, and I guess I've always thought that for crisis communications, you would have to have a plan for what if there's a tornado? What if there's a fire? What if an asteroid falls on the building? You know, <laughs> and uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier that it's possible to create one plan and then possibly just plug in the details as you're creating that. And so now I'm thinking about, so that small business owner who may have never thought, well, I should probably think about putting a crisis plan together. How would they begin to do that? And how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so they should work with, if they don't have a seasoned person on their team, they, they, they could probably, I'm not sure about, you know, um, finding maybe through um, their small business association or something like that. There may even be classes, but basically you want to start, uh, you know, we always say in PR, start with the research. So what is the risk analysis for your business? So if you're in a high tornado area and you know, you're going to get hit with, you know, tornadoes every year, and it's only a matter of time then you're, you're going to use that as one of your main scenarios. But another scenario could just be a crisis of some kind of, um, what do I want to say, natural disaster. So you have a natural disaster kind of crisis. And then you think about, okay, given what I'm doing, for example, um, I worked with a homeless shelter. So, you know, they were very specific. If there's a natural disaster and the shelter can't be open to house people, how are we going to communicate that? It's a homeless population, correct? Um, if, um, if it's that there's a crime, because that happens, there's crimes within there, someone gets hurt or someone, you know, ultimately could be killed. Um, or if there is something that happens with an employee, those would be part of that risk management analysis. So you, you really go and look at, based on our business model, based on what we do, what are the things that are most likely to happen? And then you, you, you kind of gear your plans that way. And then from there you go into, okay, who's in charge of activating the crisis plan, right? And so, bringing people together and anticipating from the beginning, these are the people. So if it's a small company, they're going to have one person that they know, like, if I can't get to it, this is what you do. But if I'm here, I'm going to do it. With a large company, it's going to be your head of IT, your head of PR communications department, your head of marketing, your head of investor relations. You're going to have key people around the table that each have a role to play immediately should a crisis happen. And then, um, you know, knowing 
what that chain of command looks like. So is one person saying we're on a roll? Is there, you know, an email set up? Is there a phone chain if email's down and it's been, a, God forbid, a cyber attack? We're hearing a lot of those um, people getting all their information hacked. So what is our plan? And then what is our backup plan for the plan if our first method of communications um, doesn't work? And then from there, it's, it's, it's the different messages and the responses that you have prepared to go. I'm making it, I'm, I'm obviously simplifying it as much as possible because there's so much to it, um, but that's kind of the beginning of it. And that sounds great. And being the leader of the organization, that's that should be something that's on your job description would be to think future forward, uh, to be planning for any eventuality in the future. Um, well, I, I might be stepping on uh, Patricia's toes here a little bit because she she's our resident expert on business structure. But I'm also thinking now of that uh, that small business owner where they may be the entirety of. Uh, what we might call the C-suite in, in a larger organization. Maybe they have a formal board of directors. Maybe they just have an informal board of directors uh, where they've got some advisors that they tap into every now and then. Uh, is there any advantage maybe to saying, you know what, uh, you're the owner of the company and you're actually not really good on camera. Uh, we're going to have our attorney be <laughs> the spokesperson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, that's really interesting. So um, that is part of the next part of it is deciding who the spokesperson is. And typically it would be your communications person. I will say that the public, like if you have a really big corporation and your attorney ends up being the person that appears on camera, unless it's a lawsuit, if it's a different kind of crisis, the public reaction, whoops is not so good, right? And so when attorneys show up for better or worse, it's like, what are they hiding? What, you know, what are they doing? Whereas if it's the communications person, typically they are more relaxed on camera. And, and as an aside, we strongly recommend media training for anyone who will be the designated spokesperson, even if it is the director of communications, um, because we do want them to know what are the holding messages? What are then, what is the official release going to be? And yeah, that's probably gonna be run by the attorney, but unless it's like in Tylenol did a really good job and it's been forever. It's been a couple of decades now, but you know, they communicated immediately. They took full responsibility. They had people out there. They took the appropriate steps and you know, they, they remained a really strong brand as opposed to other organizations we could name and, and that, that didn't do a good job, didn't take responsibility. So um, I think you do need to find out who that person is. And if it's a small organization, certainly having a board member do it and being able to say something like, you know, while, while our CEO Daniel is taking care of employees and partners right now and, and looking to resolve this as best as possible, I, as a board member, am speaking on behalf of the organization. That's perfectly acceptable to do. And sometimes you're right, it is preferable because not all good leaders are good at reacting in that moment and being good in camera. Let's face it, you're in a crisis. You're in the worst case scenario and even preparing for it, depending on what that crisis is, you just may not be up to talking about it. So let me ask you, one of the big things right now, and there's a lot of legislation around it also, is what happens in the event that you're actually hacked, right? If a business gets hacked mm -hmm. and their customer list is breached, their um, data is somehow lost, there's rules that govern and there's a patchwork of different rules by states in terms of how fast you have to react, who do you have to notify, how do you have to notify them, things along those lines. I mean, I found out of a situation where even my license plate was involved in a data breach because one of the parking systems um, where you pay your parking meter through an app was breached and 
the company never even notified me. I found out because I subscribed to a service that watches over these various breaches. So it, obviously in a crisis system, I mean, we're sitting there and there's a crisis of confidence because oh. if I can't trust you to keep my information secure, I mean, it's one thing if my um, credit card is stolen, if my social security number is stolen, if my home number, cell phone, whatever, you know, that information. But all of a sudden now you start getting into even bigger things like even my license plate. I mean, if somebody were to get a hold of that and they were to put it on another car, they can be driving around with my plates and, you know, I can get in trouble because my car, even though it isn't my car that was involved in an accident, God forbid, or something, but I can be accused of hit and run because this thing kind of happened. So how would you, if you were counseling a company in that regard of setting up that in the event of some sort of cyber liability concern, um, you know, because we did talk about the ransomware, we did talk about a couple of those ideas that you mentioned, but how would you begin to counsel that company? Because you don't necessarily want that chief techno technology officer to come out because very often like you were just saying to Daniel's question, they're probably not going to be great on camera. Right. You know, they're great pushing keys and, you know, making things work behind the scenes. But how do you make that as something that can actually come out and putting aside the legalities of the state where the business is based, but how do you manage to get that through or do you really rely on the attorney in that regard because it is going to ultimately be a potential lawsuit? How would you start giving counsel to that kind of business? And I ask because a lot of our listeners are those solopreneurs, two, three people, mm -hmm. and how much we want to impart on them to have the right kinds of security systems, the right kinds of firewalls and everything Ultimately, people are like, I'm too small for anybody to be paying attention to. Mm. Yeah. And that's exactly who the people are paying attention to, mm. because it is the weakest link in the chain, and they can get into a lot more people through the weakest link. So how would you go about counseling them, if you will, in at least starting the process of what they may need to do? Yeah, I think the process is still the same. And definitely the attorney always has to have a seat at the table. Um, you know, you wouldn't put out an HR manual without ensuring that it was legal, right? We can't just say whatever we want in our HR manuals. Um, and so for sure, the attorney has a role in that. I think, though, that the bigger issue is remembering that, that businesses are people and our customers are people. And it's really that same process of people will appreciate and respect you more when you can be forthcoming. Now, I am not a data breach expert, and I know some of the data breaches have, you know, been so um, you know, they they could have caused major disasters, right? And so I can't say they immediately need to go public with this because there might be some times where that could actually pose more issues, but they certainly need to know what they do first, second, and third. But for 99.9% .9 of the companies, when something like that happens, you want to say, this is what happened. This is what we know. This is what we're figuring out. And this is the kind of action that we're having. And to be there, to tell it first, to take responsibility, not to be pushing it off. Even if it's, you know, sometimes an employee does something really detrimental and you see CEOs or attorneys trying to, you know, say it's an isolated incident without saying, but this was a member of our company and we take responsibility for what happened. You know, people don't want you to pass the buck. So I think there's a lot of nuance depending on, on the industry you're in, but to remember that, that good leaders 
lead and take responsibility. And whether you're doing that through your communications director or, or a board member, or it's you, the CEO, just think about like you're speaking to one person who really cares and what are you going to say to that person? That's a great point, Lorraine, that the leadership in your business. And if you're the solopreneur listening to this podcast, that's you. Um, yeah, to approach it as if you were going to sit across the table, sit down at the, you know, the kitchen table with somebody. And if you were going to make an apology, if you were going to share a message uh, to make it one on one and make it personal, uh, I love that. And, you know, that kind of leads me then to, uh, to the, another question I was thinking. So I am that solopreneur uh, listening to this podcast right now. Uh, something's happened. I need to get my message out. I need to make my apology, whatever it is I'm going to say. What would you recommend would be appropriate channels to do that? Uh, there are multiple communication channels and media out there, right? And what should they use? Yeah, I, I would start with email if email is available. Um, and make sure that the message goes out to the people that you have an established relationship with first. But really, literally five minutes later, you can pick up the phone and you can call your local TV station. You can send out a media alert if you have contacts in the media. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there and probably making some phone calls. Um, but for people that maybe, you know, say, okay, I'm going to prepare a statement, I'm going to send it to the media that are local that I know, that's the easiest path for something bigger than you're going to look at, you know, contacting, how do we want to do this? Is there a news outlet that we have a good relationship with? Should we send out a press release over the wire? I mean, there's, there's solo led companies that maybe work with freelancers or 1099s that, still could have a big impact. So you have to determine, is this a local thing? Is this a state thing? Is this a regional thing? Is it national or is it international? And then plan your response based on that. You know, where's the impact? And what I didn't hear you say was immediately posted on Facebook. Um, <laughs> you know, social media has a place. It would not be in my top two. Um, but yeah, definitely at some point, um, you know, because people go there, let's face it. I've worked with companies. I worked with a large company that had an IT failure. It was not a breach, but, um, you know, websites go down. We see that on Black Friday, right? Websites go down. Where do people go? They go to Facebook and they want customer service on Facebook. There may be a customer service department with a hundred people ready to take their call, but oh no, they're going to Facebook. So yes, if you're a large company, your, your social media people need to be trained in crisis communications too. They are definitely part of the rollout team. They're just not tier one or two in my opinion. So Lorraine, let me ask you, as we go back to your uh, statement before about reaching the media, are you targeting the assignment desk? Are you targeting um, the news producers um, at those stations? Because obviously, or outlets, whatever it is, if I don't have a relationship, if I'm just a small business owner, you know, I have a small business, retail service, whatever it is, and let's face it, 99.99% .99 of businesses out there have absolutely no need to be communicating with the media on any regular uh, basis. And even those businesses that do on occasion send out press releases, they may know some of those services that send out the releases, but a release in and of itself is almost always not going to be actually picked up by any major media um, platform because there are so many releases that are being sent out. So if I'm looking at the situation where let's just say that I am the CEO of a plumbing company mm -hmm. and something happened in my business where um, my partner is accused of something, right? Whatever it is. And I need to get ahead of it because I don't know how far it goes, right? I mean, if there was any kind of, um, accusations of theft, of inappropriate uh, sexual 
uh, behavior, things along those lines. Like I said in the beginning of the program, we live in an extremely litigious society. Right. And people will make up statements or they will say factual statements too, but we know people will just make things up all the time anyway. So I may have a partner who's being accused of something and now I have to rip out this playbook and be like, well, what am I going to do if I don't already have a plan in place? Obviously, if I had a plan in place, I may know here's some people that I can reach out to, but we also know in the media, people move around all the time, right? If I had a reporter that was at the New York Times today, tomorrow they may be at WAPO, they may be at, um, you know, the LA Times, they may be anywhere just because the reporters are constantly moving too. So if I'm looking at print, I got that. If I'm looking at broadcast, I've got even bigger issues because I got the day book, the night book, things along those lines. And by the way, I'm not even going to get into what those definitions are because that's a completely different conversation, guys. Um, But needless to say, if you're not in one of those books, you're not getting on broadcast for that particular session. Um, We'll leave it at that in terms of defining the day and night books. But how would I get that so that I know a little bit more to whom I should even turn? Yeah, I think um, what I would do in that case as the plumber is I would write an official statement and put it on the homepage of your website. That's where I would start. And in that case, I, I'm debating. Um, I might put it on Facebook as well. Um, I think it would depend on the particulars. Again, I'm not sitting down and doing the whole risk analysis with the plumber in this case. But I would put it out there even before people started to become aware of it and have that. Typically what happens is as soon as you put those kinds of things on your um, homepage, the media starts calling you, even locally. You know, somebody's spouse will see it and, and, you know, and say, hey, Joe the plumber down the street, just, you know, his accountant embezzled hundred thousand dollars from the company and you know accessed some clients uh, credit cards or something like that and so that may take care of it for you but if not I would and I probably wouldn't have said this five to ten years ago but I would probably reach out to an assignment desk and again I'm saying this sitting here in an interview without you know thinking it through ahead of time so I might totally change my mind an hour from now but if you wanted to get it on the media I'd probably start with you know um, which media outlet do you feel compelled to reach out to if you don't watch any news then you know I would reach out to a local news station and contact the assignment desk and say, here's what I've got going on. Um, You know, we've posted this on our website. Is this a story you'd be interested in covering? And I know I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. If that happened here, they would absolutely get coverage. I can't speak for other markets. If it's in New York City, they'd probably say, take a number, we'll get to you next year. But, you know, in smaller markets, that is news because they are very community driven. They do want to cover it. And the fact that the owner is reaching out to the assignment desk, I think, would have some credibility. I'd love to know your thought on that, though, as well, Jennifer, since we're both in that PR space. So for me, I mean, you mentioned Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm just thinking of the new Roker Tower now. Um, Al Roker is a great guy, and, you know, he was there for many, many years, and now he's got the Roker Tower, which is the new weather system. Um, that the NBC affiliate put there. But in terms, though, of reaching out, I mean, definitely looking at it from the perspective of the assignment desk. I mean, my concern would be the assignment desk is so overwhelmed and it would really have to be something major. You know, I am in that New York metro market. I am, um, you know, 10 miles outside of Manhattan. So for me if I had that kind of situation come up, it would definitely be the, all right, let's see, who am I going to know and how am I going to get that through and um, cross my fingers, cross my toes, cross my eyes and hope that somebody actually picks up on it. Um, I know that there's many times there's different programs that even we're trying to get through and um, trying to get that on 
uh, any kind of system is difficult. But looking at it, though, from that perspective, I think that I would look at really social, and I would, even though Twitter is a place of problems so um, for a lot of people, is, like it's yeah. the arguments, the media is definitely on Twitter. Yeah. They are watching Twitter. They're watching specific hashtags on Twitter. And I would probably put it on Twitter before Facebook even mm-hmm. um, in terms of getting it out there, along with a basic statement from the crisis communications person, whoever that may be. So if um, Joe's Joe plumbing one, was involved, <laughs> I'm sorry? Does Joe have a crisis communications person that's what i'm wondering presumably it's going to be joe who's involved in putting out that statement and it's <laughs> simply going to be listen we know that something is being uh talked about right. we take this very seriously in terms of what we're doing and where we need to go and everything but uh we welcome inquiries we want to hear from other people that may have similar uh, situations, similar stories. That way we can figure out how deep the problem goes and get out ahead of it rather than be reactionary. Uh, people are seeing that the media is at least going to, I believe, take it a little bit easier yes. on Joe because he is trying to be um, proactive in the uh, issue. A lot of times when somebody is just saying, well, you know what, it's really not important, whatever, that's where people get into trouble because it's the reactionary politics of it all as opposed to the proactive. So um, the media at least will take it easier on you if you do try and get out ahead of it. And that would be my recommendation anyway. Yeah, and I think the protocol of telling the truth and being the first one to break it when you can, and if you can't be the first one to break it, and sometimes that happens, the media finds out before, you know, the head of the company does, but you at least come forward immediately and say, we're aware of the situation, we don't have enough details for a statement at this time, but we will in the next whatever, hour, two hours, whatever it is, you let people know. The other thing I would add is in an age of video, If there is someone that's comfortable on video making a statement, putting that on the website and then linking to that other places as well, because we we know that there are so many different publications, um, online publications that will use consumer driven video. So if you supply them with a way to share your statement, that certainly doesn't hurt. So that's just another thing to consider. Absolutely. And just one thing about video, make sure at least that you have lighting that (laughs) works for you. Um, Because the last thing we want is for you to look like one of the old time villains, because the court of public opinion will just destroy you. Yeah, for sure. Um, So let me ask you guys, though, as we look at wrapping up this conversation, I mean, there's so much that is out there. And All too often, these crises pop up, and sometimes it's just a cacophony of crises at once um, that we kind of run into, right? I mean, COVID in and of itself was a massive crisis. And then we had the credit crisis because the banks stopped lending money. Um, because people weren't in a position to really cover the uh, business anymore. And you had retail being forced to close because you weren't able to be in business. So the restaurants then having to pivot and everything. So if I was looking at something, obviously nobody really was thinking there's going to be an international global pandemic that's going to turn the world on its head and shut the entire world down for a year. But Um, there are smaller instances though, where you have a hurricane that comes ashore Mm -hmm. and you have to close your doors for two days, three days, but sometimes it turns into your wedding venue. And well, if you close your doors, what happens, right? If I am selling wedding dresses and the bride needs to pick up her dress and
and I can't be open and, you know, there's a whole lot of other stuff or um, the cameras that I just recorded the um, event yesterday, all of a sudden today they were in my studio. I thought it was safe. My computers that I backed it up to are gone and I lose everything. There's a lot that can happen. So you want to think what you're going to be able to do. But as we really look at wrapping up on crises, think about really where you're going and what you can do, because that's going to be a major important piece. But let me ask you, though, um, Lorraine, as we uh, try and really give more information to people, uh, can you let people know how they can find you? And I understand that there's a blog that you guys wrote that really talks in greater detail about um, these crises and having a plan. Can you let us know how we can find more information on that? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. So um, yeah, you can see our site and our and then find our blog at prosperforpurpose.com. And our blog, if you want to go directly to the blog, is just blog.prosperforpurpose.com. And you can reach me at Lorraine, it's L-O-R-R-A-I-N-E, at prosperforpurpose.com if you want to talk more about crisis communications. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And uh, it's definitely something you guys are going to want to really take to heart. Like I said, way, way, way too many times in this episode, um, at least anyway, you want to make sure that you've got a plan in place. You want to make sure that you have your advisory board in place. People like Lorraine that can help you come up with the right kinds of wording in the event of a crisis is important. Like we said, you want your attorney, your insurance guy, your banker, your accountant, all of those kinds of people in your favor right now before there is an issue and an informal advisory board. Your uh, media specialist is definitely going to be one of those people too uh, that you want to at least know of somebody before you run into an issue rather than dealing with it after you run into an issue. So for Daniel, Patricia, Lorraine, and myself. This has been another episode of It's the Bottom Line That Matters, and here's to your success.